Welcome everybody to the BVI webinar. Today we're going to talk about the iPure, which is the only monofocal IOL that's preloaded in a single piece and three piece. I want to welcome our esteemed faculty, Eric Donenfeld, Elizabeth Yu, Bill Wiley, and Vance Thompson. Please make sure you address all your questions in the text box below so that we can answer them throughout the webinar. And also make sure that you stay tuned to the very end for your complimentary patient education box that BVI has made for us so that we can have PPE that better prepares us for the COVID crisis. Let's get started. Now, our first speaker, Eric Donenfeld, is going to talk about partnering with BVI. Take it away, Eric. Thanks, Nicole. It's great to be here with all my friends today. And I'm very privileged to have worked with BVI for a very long time. And um, I don't go back the full 100 years of BVI's history, but I've worked with them for a long time. And for years, BVI has really been the gold standard. Uh, beaver blades have been what we've all looked for when we want to have sharp, disposable instruments. BVI is the fastest growing diversified company in ophthalmology, offering a broad range of single use instruments, custom packs, ophthalmic equipment, and IOLs across the world. Not only monofocal lens, but in Europe and other parts of the world, a wonderful trifocal IOL. And BVI really has a mission to, to deliver high quality solutions and innovation for advancing eye surgery. So when you think about BVI, you think about beaver blades, but Clearly, BVI is more than just blades. It's, it's a variety of different uh, instruments that have branched out not only from cataract surgery, but also to vitreoretinal uh, and also to glaucoma surgery as well. So we have endoptics, we have the Melosa line of disposable instruments, which really are identical to my expensive multi-use instruments. We have a great viscoelastic. The parasol plug has been my plug of choice for 20 years, and I've been working with them for a long time. Uh, vitro-retinal instruments, Visitech cannulas are the gold standard, wet cells and wet field cautery. All these instruments uh, allow BVI to provide custom packs that really individualize the packs to the individual surgeon. So you get exactly what you need and nothing more. And it allows for very competitive pricing where you only use the things that you need, which makes it very cost effective. I think, you know, when we're in the OR and we have this amazing partnership with industry to be able to supply us with all these products, it's great. But tell us a little bit about what happened when you were in New York and the pandemic was, you know, exploding in New York City and in the areas surrounding, you know, how did BVI respond to what your needs were at that time? Well, Nicole, that's a great question. And going back to the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, this is March and April of 2020. It was really dark times. We were really scared. We didn't know what was happening. A thousand people were dying a year in New York and hospitals were running out of instrumentation and, and sterile gowns. And I remember seeing nurses going to work wearing, literally wearing garbage bags uh, over their clothing to protect themselves. And um, this speaks to the character of BVI. They called me up and they said, Eric, do, do, do you need help in New York? And I said, yes, we really could use help. And without asking, they said, we'd like to donate 40,000 isolation gowns. And I contacted a few of the hospitals where I knew they needed this for, for protection for the nurses and uh, technicians and doctors in the hospital. And, and BVI just stood out to me as a type of corporate partner that I want to work with. And for me, working with companies and industry is about technology, but it's also about individual relationships. And BVI understands the relationship between ophthalmologists and their patients, and they value that. And that's the kind of company that's a high quality company that, that has a moral high ground that makes me feel very good about working with them. So BVI is really taking the lead in developing and launching new gowns and partnering with hospitals to really protect uh, our most valuable people, our first responders, who are really dealing with this epidemic, which is uh, really going all through the United States today. You mentioned relationships. And I think that 
you know, part of the fun in being in ophthalmology is being surrounded by people that are like-minded and care about patient care and put patients first. And this has clearly shown me uh, that BVI is not just another uh, company that just wants to get beaver blades in. It's a company that actually wants to invest in the surgeon and the patient experience. So thank you so much, Eric. So these are well, the patient packs, Eric. Can you describe this? In the era of COVID-19, BVI stepped up again being extremely innovative. And I remember talking to Brooke and Amy at, at, at BVI about this. And the goal in ophthalmology as a surgeon I think all of our surgeons here today would agree with this. Our goal is to provide the most technologically advanced examination and surgery to provide our patients with the best vision possible. Well, we've added another layer today to that relationship to patients. And patients not only want the best vision and the best quality vision, but they also want to have the safest examination possible. They want to feel that they're in an environment that they can feel comfortable. And BVI understands that. And they develop these convenient patient packs that contain an ear loop mask, a bouffant cap, shoe covers, and a optional isolation gown. And we can offer that to our patients and to our staff alike. And it, it's really made it very comfortable for our patients to come in for examinations where we can provide them with protection that they feel they need and that they want when they're coming in for an ophthalmic examination. One of the nice things about attending this webinar today, and I'm gonna sign up for it right as soon as I go offline here, is you can request a sample pack at the end of the webinar, and you can get one of these packs sent to you so you can see what you can give to patients or have for yourself and for your staff. So I think this resonates with all of us because you know when a patient walks into our office, they walk into the surgery center, they want to know that everyone's protected, taking all these precautions. And I, I think this is just great. Um, so thank you so much for your insight on what it means to partner with BVI and be a part of uh, their family and products. Uh, next, we're going to get into the optics. And so Liz Yu does optics better than anybody else, and she's going to help describe what this lens is, how it functions, and how it can fit into your practice. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Nicole. That's a really tall order, but I will do my best. Um, you know, when we think about monofocals and monofocal IOLs, I mean, what differentiates one monofocal from another, and why would I choose um, one lens versus another? Obviously, efficiency is going to be important, but then contrast sensitivity, quality of vision. And then now it's becoming recognized that there is some level of depth of focus that we are all thinking about. So when we take these into consideration, this is how I kind of frame my mind as to even when I'm looking at a monofocal, which one would I choose? And obviously we recognize that spherical aberration is a high order aberration that is different from one monofocal to the next. And to kind of describe a little bit of that, and then to go into the iPure IOL and why that specific blended aspheric design provides really the best of both worlds. When we look at the optical system, right? So we know that spherical aberration is gonna change. The corneal spherical aberration runs about plus 0.27 microns. That does not change during life. So that's always pretty much the same. What does change in contrast sensitivity and quality of vision is what happens from the contribution of the actual crystalline lens. And that alone can cause vision to have a decreased contrast sensitivity beyond just the actual murkiness that happens because of the cataract. So in a 25-year-old patient, in a younger patient, the actual contribution of the lens is a negative spherical aberration, which then balances out what's in the cornea to provide a net neutral spherical aberration, especially in a dilated state, which is going to provide a very high quality vision. As we get older and we see more birthdays, that crystalline lens gains positive spherical aberration. So once you have a patient who is 65, 75, 85 years old, the quality of vision, particularly in mesopic conditions where the pupil is dilated, is going to be worse because now you've got the positive spherical aberration from the cornea, and now you're adding more positive spherical aberration uh, from the lens, and that creates a greater myopic refraction, particularly into the evening, and that will create more glare and more issues, and that's what we know occurs, especially with early cataracts. 
So essentially, so let's just look at spherical aberration in a lens system. If we're looking at um, more central rays, as you can see here from the left through the right, and then you know that the actual paraxial or the more marginal rays, the more peripheral rays with positive spherical aberration, they are gonna bend more sharply as compared to what is happening in the center. So if you look at positive spherical aberration from the left, as you can see here in that dilated state, there would be that myopic shift peripherally plus what you're getting centrally, that's gonna create greater blur. As compared to a neutral spherical aberration, so zero asphericity, like in the center here, would create um, the lens itself a more unified image onto the retina. And then negative spherical aberration would be beyond what is seen centrally, but in that peripheral lens system, that could counterbalance any other spherical aberration, which is the idea of why we have to think of this as an entire optical system. So as we move forward, and what is the influence of looking at an aspheric IOL? So up top, as you can see, when we're looking at a spherical IOL, so a spherical IOL is roughly going to have positive spherical aberration. So you add what's in the cornea plus the positive of spherical aberration that equals greater positive spherical aberration. What can that do? That can create a greater depth of focus because as we know, that corneal contribution of the higher order aberration adds to the optical pseudo accommodation, which may give you a greater depth and range, meaning it won't be just sharp-ish into the distance, but they may experience some level of having um, some near vision, but it does provide a worse overall visual quality because of all that we just mentioned before. Now, if you look at a negative spherical aberrated lens going into the system that's going to counterbalance the positive that's in the cornea, that is going to, on the retinal surface with all other lower aberrations of sphere and astigmatism being accounted for, create a very high quality vision at into distance, but then of course the depth of focus would be negatively affected. So what does that mean? If we're looking at a patient, whether it's a spherical or an aspheric lens, because as you know, spherical aberration is a higher order aberration. Well, there's a few of them, but when you look at the peripheral um, spherical aberration that is a third or fourth order, high order aberration, it is kind of a more peripheral ring, right? So in a smaller pupil, that elevation that occurs peripherally does not play a role as much. So the image quality in a small pupil in a patient with a spherical lens versus an aspheric or negatively spherically aberrated lens, the image quality would be relatively similar, maybe a little sharper with the aspheric lens, not a huge difference. In comparison, in the next slide, as you will see, is with a larger pupil size, there will be a potential difference. Not to say that there's gonna be an, a metamorphopsia that's occurring in the vision, but rather that there's a blur because of the positive spherical aberration that is adding to a myopic shift with the peripheral light rays, and that creates a greater blur. So the next slide is gonna actually demonstrate, you know, in real world, what that would mean. So let's say that this is a larger five millimeter aperture eye. When you are looking on the left with a negative aspheric lens compared to a spherical IOL in an optical system, as you can appreciate here, the quality of what you were able to see in the distance with this would be better appreciated with a higher quality vision with the negative aspheric lens. Similarly, how does this play out if we are in a mesopic condition, as you can see in the next slide, in an evening condition. And as you can see here on the left, a spherical IOL design, this would, the image quality would potentially not be as clear as if you were to look at a, uh, an image like on the right, which in a dilated scenario, it provides that higher quality vision throughout. All right, so now we understand 
how high order operations can contribute to the quality of vision, but what about depth of focus with um, IOLs? So when we look at depth of focus, a spherical lens is going to provide a greater higher, uh, I'm sorry, pseudo accommodation or that depth of focus because as we discussed, because there are actual multiple points that are not quite at the retina, that stretches the point of the actual vision. So here, it creates that slight myopic effect, particularly in a more dilated pupil. So when you look at that spherical IOL up top, as compared to a, an image of utilizing a negative aspheric IOL, while at Plano, so on this defocus curve, at Plano, the quality is clearly higher with the negative spherical um, Aber the negative aspheric IOL, the actual MTF or the quality of vision is going to drop very quickly when you go on either side with any um, uh, deep focus with a positive or negative diopteric powers as compared to the spherical IOL. You can see here there is a little bit more forgiveness in the depth of focus as you can see demonstrated on the defocus images. What is the benefit of looking at the best of both worlds? We want to provide a greater depth of focus, if possible, as well as a higher quality of vision. So looking at the iPure lens optic specifically, it has a very unique design. The actual central 2.4 millimeter zone equates to a, a, a zero asphericity. So a neutral spherical aberrated zone right in the center. So what it does is that would leave behind just what's available in the cornea. That potentially is just positive spherical aberration in a smaller pupil, which could then help at least provide a little bit of depth of focus. What's very interesting is that zone one itself, which is the very center, uh, closer to the 1.8 millimeter button itself, it actually has a slight positive spherical aberration to it too. I think that alone is actually providing more depth of focus there because the very center does have greater positive spherical aberration while the actual 2.4 millimeter zone blends to being spherically neutral. And that clinically has played out for me. And then beyond the 2.4 millimeter zone, it ends up being a negative aspheric IOL with a minus 1.8 uh, microns of spherical aberration. So ultimately, in that dilated state, it can help provide that higher quality of vision because it helps to neutralize part of what's going on from the cornea. So when you look at other negative spherical aberration lenses, the technicism minus 0.27, which is supposed to completely neutralize it, and then the acrosophism minus 0.20 with the monofocal. Why is that important? There's just a little bit of controversy as to what is actually better, leaving a patient a little bit plus, um, or if it is to completely neutralize it, regardless having some um, neutralizing factor, uh, if you look at the studies, does provide that higher level, like that eagle vision with that extra uh, visual uh, acuity. So when we look at spherical aberration itself, if you look at a spherical aberrated lens, so a positive spherical lens, this is just demonstrating that, you know, it's going to be throughout one uh, power itself. Uh, but when you start looking at a negative spherical aberration lens, so when the pupil becomes bigger, obviously uh, what it would do is it helps to uh, neutralize what's going on in the cornea. So its functional power decreases, as you can see here on the y-axis. And the modified spherical aberrated lens, or the iPure, would have the benefits of uh, the actual spherical lens, uh, as well as the negative uh, aspheric IOL. And it actually for the iPure lens, it's relatively resistant to the effects of decentration, unlike what you would experience with a normal negative aspheric IOL, which has it all throughout. You can appreciate here that when you have an aspheric IOL, while the contrast is extremely high when there's zero decentration, 
The way that IOL is with any decentration, there's a very, very steep decrease in the contrast. So this would be important in a setting of somebody who may have zonular laxity or otherwise, as compared to the iPure lens, it has a higher uh, contrast sensitivity, but it is because it has uh, some negative aspheric uh, upon dilation, but the center is not, it's a zero sphericity. Even with some decentration, it truly uh, does provide a better contrast compared to your standard aspheric eye well because of the spherically neutral center. Great discussion uh, so far on the optics, but you know, who, you know, we, we all have a lot of monofocals that we use. So who is the, the correct patient to use this monofocal on? And, and how have you, you've used it clinically? How has that played out for you in your practice? Sure. Um, well, I think obviously a lens like this would be, you know, really kind of quote unquote safe and provide a high quality vision for any patient, whether it's a naive cornea, but in particular those with more aberrated corneas, like a post LASIK, a post RK, someone who has keratoconus, those patients that you do not want to, to add or take away uh, any other higher order aberrations as compared to what already their cornea provides, this lens is a great option to be able to provide that higher quality of vision. But it, it's just easier for me now to not even worry about which lens goes in which eye because I know that this provides the best of both worlds, right? That higher visual quality that I'm looking for um, and maybe a little depth of focus. Now it's only a, you know, a small sample size, but I will definitely say that aiming for minus a quarter to minus 50 in the non-dominant eye and then a plano in the dominant eye, I've, had, I've been very surprised at how much intermediate and near, so at 66 and 40 centimeters, my patients have been able to see, and it's more than I would have expected out of a monofocal lens, but I'm sure leaving behind the corneal spherical aberration um, with the neutral central zone, and maybe that small positive bump in the right, right in the very center may have an effect because we know depth of focus can increase with that. Right, now, Bill, you've had the most experience out of all of us with this lens. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the stability and uh, reference to issues with tilt? We know from Mitch Weikert and um, the Baylor group, their work, that there is a certain percentage of patients that are gonna be tilted before surgery and after, and it can account for some of uh, the issues that we're having post-operatively with astigmatism that we can't explain. What's your experience with this lens? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nicole. You know, in general, I've had a lot of experience and had, you know, great outcomes with this lens. One thing, you know, that I like about this lens is the platform that it sits on. It's a relatively stiffer um, acrylic. Uh, you'll see there's different styles of acrylics. If you use a number of lenses, you know, some acrylic is a little bit more flex flexible. Some, let's say, hydrophilic acrylic is almost floppy inside the eye and some acrylics are a little bit stiffer. I would say this is one of the stiffer acrylic materials that I've used. And what I've seen is that translates into short-term and long-term stability. We've all seen those lenses that maybe at day one, they're Plano, but at week one, they might be minus 75, and at month one, they're plus 75 or something like that. They might have this sort of healing curve where they don't hit their final target quickly. I see that with this platform, the short-term stability is is, is very stable. I, I feel like patients achieve their uh, effective lens position uh, almost immediately. That can help guide you sort of when you're, play, when you're planning that second eye. You can see how did the first eye do and make plans for the second eye. Um, it also gives you sort of confidence in long-term stability. Like you said, Nicole, tilt or decentration. You want a lens that can you know, stand the test of time and can stay stable in the eye. And I, I really just have not seen any stability issues with this lens. Um, other things that you look at in acrylic platforms as far as you know, clarity of the uh, lens material, I have not seen glistenings with this platform. So it's a very clear uh, acrylic material. So short and long-term, it stays clear and stable. So overall, I think it's, it's, it's a great lens, uh, you know, it's just sort of a workhorse that covers a lot of ground. And like Liz discussed, you know, as far as that aspheric optic, in the past, we sort of had this concern when you might use an aspheric optic, there might have been a potential compromise, maybe in depth of focus or 
if it were to decenter, might you lose the effect of that asphericity? And uh, thankfully, this lens sort of is forgiving as far as those things are concerned. It's kind of the best of all worlds. So I think, Liz, you covered it well. And uh, all in all, uh, yeah, that kind of translates to my experience. Eric, do you have anything to add? Well, I think Liz covered it really well. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, how quickly the lens opened, how rapidly it's centered in the capsular bag. And I think Bill's exactly right that you do get effective lens position very quickly. Um, uh, I did notice that my patients had increased depth of field. And what I, what I need to know with a little more experience is whether with the um, depth of field that you get, do you get a larger landing zone? Can you be off by a quarter doctor or a half a doctor and still get 20-20 vision? And my, my, my expectation is that, yes, you will be able to have a little bit more latitude on your refractive error because of the uh, optics of this lens so that you can have more happy patients with more 2020 results, even if you're off by a quarter or a half a doctor because of the optics of the lens. So that's worth evaluating, looking more. But I've been very favorably impressed with my initial use of the lens. We talked um, in the past about, you know, when you're going to talk to a patient about a technology that maybe you haven't used before. Um, how do you decide how to adopt a new technology and, and what were your first impressions of this lens uh, to help you use this in more patients? For me, um, I just have absolutely uh, loved, you know, this aspheric design like Liz went over. And I spend time talking with patients how I work hard to center cataract surgery on their visual axis. And by the time they get done talking with me, they know that the pupil center is not where they necessarily look through and where that implant sits in their capsule. And I use things like a grape and a grape skin and how this capsulotomy is so important and how this optic uh, is less sensitive to that issue because it's oftentimes going to center based on the capsular bag. And so having something that's less sensitive to decentration, I think is really important. And having these really advanced aspheric uh, optics that have really taken advantage of what we've learned over the last 10, 15 years about asphericity um, really gets patients excited about a monofocal and that's kind of a, a rarity. Eric mentioned the depth of focus. Uh, I have to admit, I've used 21 of these implants so far. I'm gonna be talking in a little bit about the ease of injection and using the technology, but I've read a lot about it and my patients that are the you know, early you know, recipients of it have been excited about the asphericity and the less sensitivity to decentration. And so I, I've, I've found it really easy to talk about. I found that I had a lot of confidence talking to the patients because I knew Bill's experience. And so, you know, I knew that he wasn't going to put a lens in that wasn't performing. Um, so that was actually really helpful to me. And, you know, people say, you know, why do you use all these different lenses? Why don't you just stick to one fastball? And for me, I'm never going to learn about new technology and how I can keep pushing things forward if I don't try new things. Um, so, so that was really helpful for me. Um, speaking of Bill Wiley, uh, we're going to get into kind of how we can um, have this predictability and, and efficiency in the practice. And there's no one better than Bill Wiley to talk about being efficient in the OR. So uh, let's sure. get started. Thanks, Nicole. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the IPR lens, how it's designed for efficiency and predictability. You know, we, we all know that situation when we're trying to self-load a lens and you're working with new staff or even experienced staff and it's a new product. And you look through the different steps that you go through to load that lens. You have the preoperative steps, you need the forceps, you need the injector, you need the cartridge, all that has to be there and ready for implantation. You've got to uh, prepare the cartridge with OVD and maybe, maybe you used all the OVD during the case or maybe they have the wrong OVD, but that's one other thing that's on your mind. You've got to load the lens <clears throat> and you can do it yourself, but that takes time or you can sort of delegate that. But, you know, if you've ever worked with a scrub tech that says, oh yeah, I can, I can load the lens, no problem. But then you get it and it's upside down or if it has a scratch in it, 
or a haptic that's torn or bent. And then you have that extra concern. So you're like, well, should I just do it myself? But do I have time? Or maybe you're presbyopic and you can't load the lens yourself. So you have all these different considerations, but you have to, you, it has to get loaded one way or the other. Now you've got to insert the lens. The actual insertion technique and style has to be you know, controlled, safe, has to be reproducible. You have to feel confident, even in challenging cases, are you gonna insert it properly? And then once all that's done, you've got you know, a post-operative state where you've gotta make sure all your equipment is taken care of, that your, your forceps are put back on the tray, that the uh, you know, metal you know, injector is taken care of, is cleaned properly. Um, and you've got to make sure that you've got all those things, you know, set up for the next case or the, you know, the next week's cases. So there's a lot that goes into self-loading lenses. Um, and so you can compare that to a preloaded uh, lens. And once you've tried a preloaded lens and you can eliminate all those steps, it's hard to go back to self-loading. Look, you know, at all the different steps you can eliminate with a preloaded uh, lens system. You know, basically you just boil it down to you prepare the injector with OVD and then you insert the lens. Everything else gets thrown away. Uh, you don't have to worry about separate cartridge and, and loading forceps, all those other things, cleaning, um, you know, safety, infection, or tasks, all those other variables can be eliminated with a preloaded system. On top of that, it's very efficient. You know, uh, you know, we've seen an ROR, it's about 22 seconds from the time that lens is handed to me till it's in the bag and positioned. Uh, you can imagine, you know, in the best case scenario with your best scrub tech, uh, or you, if you do it yourself, best case scenario, you might be able to do it in you know, 30 or 40 seconds, but that's with like the best, like sort of NASCAR pit crew team uh, in the world to do that in 30 seconds with a self-loading system. Basically with anybody, you can be any scrub tech, any nurse, I can do it in 22 seconds. All they have to do is hand me the lens. It's that easy. So. You know, I find particularly if I'm going to be working in unfamiliar environments, if you ever, so you might have your A team at your ASC and everything goes perfect nearly every time, but then you go to the hospital and you're not even sure, are they going to have the cartridge or going to have the injector? Are they going to have your lens even, you know, all the other pieces that go with it. So, you know, whenever I go to a hospital, it's like a must that I have to have a preloaded system because I don't want to have to worry about any of those other variables. And, uh, and or who's the scrub tech going to be with me. Some, you know, maybe it's a tech that's been doing ortho cases all day and it's thrown into the eye room. So you just have this confidence when it's preloaded, you can do it efficiently, efficiently and reproducibly every time. So we looked at in ROR on average, you know, the IP, IPR delivery system is about 22 seconds, which compares, you know, uh, significantly favorably with, with other systems, you know, 30 to 40 seconds. But like I said, that's 30 or 40 seconds with a pretty good, you know, you know, NASCAR, you know, you know, pit crew. We've got our systems down even with our self-loaded, but that's with the A-team, you know, 22 seconds with anybody you give me, I can put, you know, I can get this lens loaded and injected within 22 seconds. All you have to do is hand me the lens and, and we're good to go. We've got, uh, you know, videos showing that we can do it in as fast as 10 seconds. You know, I've done it, you know, literally thousands of cases with this lens. So I'm very, you know, comfortable with it. Uh, but, you know, when you first start, you know, I think you'll definitely be, you know, under 30 seconds. And then once you use it, it's very easy to become quick and efficient. You know, other things that, you know, I think we sometimes take for granted, but when you look at, you know, what's required for cleaning metal injectors, you know, there's a number of steps that should be done for every case to prevent uh, things like TAS. Are all those steps being done on every case that you do? If you do, you know, you know, dozens of cases, you know, you know, uh, it, you know, in a month or you know, hundreds or thousands of cases, is, are, is every one of those steps being done properly? Thankfully, if you can convert to a preloaded system, you've got all those steps taken care of. You don't even have to worry about it. So just, you know, you don't even, you don't, if you ever have TAS, God forbid, you, it, you, at least you can say it's not coming from the lens or injector system if you're using this preloaded system. Thanks so much. We're going to um, shift gears and have Vance Thompson talk about his early experience putting this lens in and some pearls about uh, how to deliver the lens. Well, thank you, Nicole, and, and great job, team. Honored to be here. And 
like I said, I've done 21 of these, so I'm early in my process and was so excited uh, to get started. And uh, maybe we'll uh, start the video. And, uh, you know, in the beginning here, I'm going to be doing the uh, cortical cleanup. And one of the things that I work really hard on is uh, centering my capsulotomy on the visual axis, just like I'm going to center the optic. So I've used a corneal marker and worked hard to get a 5.0 to 5.2 millimeter diameter capsulotomy. So I get good overlap of this beautiful optic. So with capsular contraction, it doesn't decenter. My team loves preparing this technology because it's, you know, so easy how the preloaded works. But I love the narrow injector tip. It goes through my 2.4 incision beautifully. I love how you can see those colored haptics. That slight left movement, I don't know if you saw that, but I found that when I inject it and do that slight movement to the left, it dials it just beautifully into the bag in one movement, unfolds at a great uh, speed, and uh, then I can get behind and in front of the optic nicely to get all my viscoelastic. I'm someone who believes there's a happy spot for implants in the bag, and so sometimes I have to dial a little bit more to seem to center, but this one just centered so beautiful, and I look forward to using more to see if it's going to continue to center like this and like it has in my first 21 cases. But those two lines show that the two things that I'm really working hard to center are the capsulotomy on the visual axis and the optic on the visual axis. So there was capsular contraction. That optic, that anterior capsule just shrink wraps around that anterior optic. So that I not only get short-term centrated IOLs, they're centrated on the long run with minimizing any lens tilt so that these beautiful optics can serve this patient well for the rest of their life. Yeah, I think um, your point about when you inject, you wanna be deep with the inserter and then that little slight move off to the side, uh, to the left is big because the optic is stiff. It's stiffer than the Acrosoft material. It's stiffer than the Technus. Um, Liz, do you have any pearls that you experienced when you were just implanting the lens? The lens is an, is, a, is an injector system versus a push system. It's a little bit shorter than what we're maybe used to when we're dialing it. So there's a little learning curve there of getting used to your hand position and knowing, um, but the rotation of it, of the injector system, is very smooth and it's very easy um, to follow. The one beautiful thing, I think there's actually a study that does demonstrate that this lens, it doesn't get stuck it's not that you're gonna find a haptic that is stuck within the injector system or broken off. I mean, it injects, the one piece injects beautifully each and every time. Um, and it just requires a little bit of viscoelastic and advancing, which is really, really nice. Um, I do notice that I can inject it through the 2.2 millimeter, but it does require a little bit of um, focused concentration from the patient too, to just kind of look straight ahead as well. So with that patient assist, um, but it does dial in very well. And uh, truly, I believe that maybe the optic haptic junction, if you measure the width of that, it's a little bit longer than six millimeters. And I really like that coverage to actually go in the temporal area, because I'm hoping that if I do align it uh, horizontally, especially because it feels or it seems like it's a little bit broader than your normal six millimeter optic that it's going to actually help with preventing uh, negative dysphotopsia. So we'll see. Uh, so this next uh, video is from Bill. So take us through uh, just how do you set up the injector and, and I understand you do all of this yourself. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, I'm used to just doing a lot of the stuff myself. So basically, you can, what's nice is you can confirm the actual lens power right on the lens. So it's basically, this is a 20 diopter lens. You load with viscoelastic. There's a little port. You just inject a little bit of viscoelastic. You remove, there's a little stabilization cover and outer cover. Those pop off very easily. And once it's removed, you just um, you know dial the lens forward. It's a plunger, I'm sorry, it's a screw style, not a plunger style. So it's very controlled, very slow and um, measured and injects, you know, the haptics 
are always both perfectly folded over the optic like this every time. You know, a lot of times when you self-load, maybe the leading is, you know, not, you know, uh, folded on the optic and it's kind of point, pointing straight ahead and can be stiff and can break a bag or sometimes the trailing's caught up uh, in the injector system and that can get, you know, kind of twisted or pulled or, you know, you know, you know interfering with the injection. But this, every time both haptics are sitting right over the optic, what's nice is those blue tips will never sort of attach themselves to each other or to the optic. If you've ever seen that with some of the other acrylics where they get stuck to the optic or to each other and you're kind of waiting and hoping uh, that they release uh, this with the little blue tips, you can like dance as you can see them as they're injecting, but they also um, won't stick to each other or to the uh, optic. Um, but, you know, again, this is sort of, if you've seen one injection, you've seen them all more or less with this system. They're all, it's very consistent, very reproducible, um, and uh, it dials nice into the bag. I think uh, I like Vance's tip. You know, he 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 did it. You know, you know, just twenty times and figured out some pearls that probably took me hundreds or thousands of cases to figure out. But it is nice. You know, that little left twist allows it to dial for you know start sort of start dialing ahead of time. So it's neat, Vance. That's a, a cool little pearl. Uh, but all in all, it's great. I, I'll, I'll pass it to Liz, who's going here. It really does actually dial very nicely, you know, with, with ease um, in your normal distended capsular bag with viscoelastic. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, essentially, you know, when I do inject it, I really do feel that aligning it horizontally, it just finds its place and it has that really nice broad coverage, which I think is a, is a nice plus. Yeah. Um, I know I'm going to get into my learning curve in just a moment, but Bill, you know, you do a lot of intraoperative aberometry. Can you comment on how this is just so nice to like have it available right away and not have to worry um, about going and grabbing another lens and loading it and all of that? Yeah, it, it does help a lot for efficiency there. Um, if you do aberometry, often you're, you're basically walking in not knowing which lens you're going to use. And so you're waiting for that reading. And then, uh, and then you've got to call out the lens. And then typically then they're opening the lens, sometimes opening the cartridge, opening the injector, and you're adding a minute or two to the case. With, with this system, as soon as you call the lens, it's just open and you're basically good to go and inserting very quickly and efficient, efficiently. I would say that the, the one um, kind of pearl regarding intraoperative aberometry, what's nice is when you take that pseudophagic aberometry reading, you feel confident that effective lens position is true, that it's maintaining stability in its effective lens position. So you can feel confident that the sphere reading that you, you measure on the table, that pseudophagic reading is gonna be pretty close to where they're gonna sit you know, day one, week one, or, and or month one. Great, so uh, one of the things that I noticed is that you really wanna have a deep insertion. If you look at the videos um, of Bill and, and Vance and Liz, when you put the inserter in, if you have a 2.4 millimeter um, uh, uh, incision, you wanna be right at, there's like a natural stop on the actual, you see if you just keep going, keep going, keep going, so I didn't go far enough here. And you wanna go actually all the way to the hub. And I found that that ensures that you get this kind of deep insertion. Um, the first case that I did, I, got, I, I kind of ran out of uh, room when I was trying to uh, use the plastic inserter to push it forward. And then I learned this trick that Vance figured out pretty quickly where I just shift it to the side so that the haptic doesn't get caught uh, in the incision. Eric, you know, how did your staff feel about, you know, using this preloaded system? Were they excited about it or how did they feel? You know, we're always trying new things in our OR. We have all, you know, a lot of studies going on and my staff always looks at me a little bit cross-eyed when I say, okay, we're trying this today. <laughs> I think, I think all of us here on the line have that experience. And, uh, this was one of the really pleasant surprises. It was really seamless. There was no learning curve. And my staff just looked at me after and says, you know, this, this is a keeper. This is something that we can use. And my, my staff enjoyed it. It was ease of use. It was practical. And uh, uh, my staff liked it as much as I did. That's great. Well, I just wanted to take this time to go through and thank all of you for um, sharing your experiences for being open to try new technology 
and add another lens to your armamentarium. Um, just some final thoughts. I'm just going to go down the list. Bill, you know, what, what are your final thoughts about this lens that you want, uh, you know, the, the surgeon to understand why they should adopt this technology? Sure. I think if you're looking for a simple platform that's a workhorse that has function, I can't think of really any downside to the platform. So it's something you can feel safe, you can feel comfortable using uh, as a workhorse monofocal. I think this is a must try. And I think once you do try it, I think you'll love it. Great. And Liz? You know, when we think of monofocals, it's not necessarily sexy, right? I mean, it's 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 single vision, right? But w the the attributes that we're looking for are efficiency. We want to be able to use it in everyone, um, and you want to be able to trust that it's going to provide the highest quality of vision in all scenarios with that depth of focus, if it can provide any, right? So this can be used in absolutely any patient. So it's a great go-to monofocal, and it's got those great attributes. Excellent. Vance? Um, well, I agree with everything that Bill and Liz have said. And, you know, for me, even if it was more difficult to use with an optic that's been innovated like this, with the aspherosity and just kind of learning on our past, you know, history with aspherosity and it being an advance in a monofocal, you could get me to do a lot of different things. But they're handing me something that is super easy to use that my staff uh, just loves and my, you know, ASC director loves that they're not being charged extra to have a preloaded platform that I want to have. And so there's just so many things that I would have put up with because of this advanced optic that are just beautiful with the, the simplicity of it and the streamlined use uh, and the business side of it. So uh, super excited about it. And finally, Eric. Yeah, I'll, I'll just bring it home by saying that uh, I enjoy working with BVI. I think that the relationship between a company and ophthalmology is really important. And to have a quality company that really cares about their products and offers innovative solutions I think it makes it worth our while to investigate these new technologies. And that's one of the exciting things about being an ophthalmologist is we get to try new technologies. And uh, I, I would just tell the people that are listening today, uh, give it a try. I think it's something that you'll enjoy using. You'll like working with the company and the quality vision is, is uh, unmistakable. So uh, this is another tool in the toolbox. And uh, for, for me, it's something that I've really been excited about trying and I look forward to using it more in the future. Great, well, thank you all. I just wanna encourage the audience to submit your questions in the comment or text box. And now we're gonna open up the floor to your questions. 